Dr. Jenin does an amazing job in the presentation, and I think every time I'm kind of left with, ooh, I'm ready to go. And then I'm like, oh, where the hell do I go? Oh, excuse me, where do I go? Um, so that's why we got this esteemed panel today, and thank you all for joining us. I don't know why they said yes to me, um, but this is an impactful panel in front of you. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I don't like messing up anybody's background. So we'll start off with Diego. All right, I'll keep it short because a lot of us, you guys have been here for a while. I'm Diego Wignall. I'm the state representative of Texas House District 123, which incorporates a big chunk of the entire center city. It goes all the way up to the colonnade as far south as Highway 90. It includes a big chunk of the west side and a very strangely gerrymandered piece of the east side. Hi, I'm Victoria Gonzalez. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Mayor Ron Nurbert. I help advise on development and growth issues, including zoning, housing, economic development, um, utility, streets, and a lot of the uh, infrastructure that you all deal with daily. Good afternoon, I'm Lourdes Castro Ramirez, um, and I currently serve as the chair of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, uh, created by Mayor uh, Ron Nuremberg uh, about three months ago. Um, in my sort of day job, um, I am the president of the University Health System Foundation. And just as a way of background, um, I've lived in San Antonio for about nine years. Um, my family and I relocated here in 2009 uh, when I was um, offered you know, the, the job to lead the San Antonio Housing Authority. Um, I, you know, I think that this discussion that we're having um, is critically important. Um, we are um, at a at a time where I, I do feel optimistic, um, Dr. Brennan, um, I think that's been sort of my outlook. And so I'm you know, uh, looking forward to the conversation about how we move forward with you know, tangible, maybe realistic, reasonable solutions um, to ensure that um, neighborhoods uh, become more inclusive and more um, integrated. Um, Lourdes, yes. you missed two past three. That That's right. So I um, I also have the, the honor of uh, serving as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for the Department of Public and um, Native American Housing uh, Programs. I worked uh, very closely with um, Secretary Julian Castro in implementing uh, his agenda of uh, opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and then Saha, yes, and then I, you know, I served in the capacity of uh, President and CEO of Saha. But, you know, I think the other thing that since you mentioned this, um, um, Brian, um, the other thing that is really important, given the conversation that we're having today, is that I'm an immigrant to this country. I was born in Mexico. My family migrated to the United States when I was four. And so when we talk about these issues of home, relocation, opportunity, they really mean and resonate with me. And so I you know, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Hello, I'm Steve Endo. I'm, uh, I have my own real estate company, um, have been involved in real estate brokerage uh, since 1985. I've lived in King William since 1983. Uh, started doing development in 99 with the project in King William. Um, and uh, still involved in doing some development, uh, also some brokerage, but the development is, is infill town home development over by Pearl. We have one in King William right now. And then I'm also uh, currently chair of the Urban Land Institute uh, chapter in San Antonio. Uh, Pedro Martinez, uh, superintendent for the school district here in San Antonio SD. Uh, just been here just uh, about two and a half years. Uh, originally uh, born in Mexico, grew up in Chicago. Um, I've been in public education for about 20 years. Um, and so, you know, looking forward to this. Thank you for my this Brian. Sorry, we're going to have to toss the mic back and forth. Anybody got a fan of Run DMC? Toss it. Talk to my no? Okay. We'll hook we'll you up after the event. Um, so I guess the first question I have for all of you is, um, from Dr. Drennan's presentation, what is the part that stood out to you the most? Well, like you, I've, I've seen it several times. And for those of you who haven't seen it, there's also a version of the presentation that she does that's key to the schools, the school districts, and education. This one had, had more to do with residential, but she ties that part together very, very quickly. Because I've seen it so many times, and because of the, no, I, I go on it. I go purposely to go see it. I seek it out. But because of the job that I have, um, what I'm most interested in 
is actually attempting to create solutions and tools. I, I think that at a certain point, you can have this conversation over and over again, and you should, um, but at a certain point, we all sort of become experts in identifying what the problem is. We become very skilled and learned in talking about the depth of it and all the different elements, but I think we're at a point now where we have to, one, accept that there's not one answer, there's no perfect solution, but that we should now arrive at a point, and certainly the work that, that you're doing with us, is to try to create tools to try to solve it. So that's that's sort of where I'm at right now. And the more she, the more that I hear her talk about it, the more I think about what those tools are. And I and I do believe we're at a place where we have to create solutions and tools because there isn't going to be one blanket answer, and we have to sort of get comfortable with that. So I arrived late um, and did miss the presentation, but I had the pleasure of being one of Dr. Drennan's students when I was at Trinity University. So um, I think one of the things that um, sticks out to me every time she gives this presentation in various forms is a, you know, a call to our history and the intentionality of um, how we live today. I'm understanding that a lot of the um, social issues and problems that we have um, now are deeply rooted in the way that the city was organized um, in some of the um, unfortunate um, racial segregation that happened. Um, one of the things, like Brian, um, Dr. Brennan taught me when we were in her class, because we used to you know, talk about you know, articles and the effects of gentrification, and um, one of the things that I'll never forget was we were um, discussing a lot of the implications of gentrification, especially in um, communities of instability, and she said, okay, great y'all are gentrifiers, so what are y'all gonna do from here? And so that's gonna be something that's really stuck with me, especially in the mayor's office as we're looking at policies and um, housing policies with the mayor's housing policy task force. I think for me, it, um, what stood out was the conversation about how important it is, um, one, for us to not forget the 1968 Fair Housing Act and the fact that you know the redlining and the discrimination that was occurring was eliminated you know, um, in 1968, and that following that, there was a huge investment of resources in communities, and a huge investment in local community institutions. And I think Dr. Brennan pointed something that I think is really important for us to understand the successes of those programs, to try to figure out how we ensure that as we move forward, we are learning from what didn't work, and also, identifying you know, um, what, you know, what did work. The other thing that I think was really critical also is that when we talk about housing, you know, we normally think about sort of bricks and mortar, the structure, the neighborhood, the infrastructure, but at the end of the day, we're talking about people, and Dr. Brennan mentioned, it's important for us to not forget that the investment in hu human capital and the investment in people, it's all related, right? And so, we do need to um, ask the question of not just housing segregation and poverty uh, from the perspective of you know, the development patterns, but also what are the opportunities that um, people have to um, improve their standing? What are the economic opportunities? What are the uh, challenges that relate to education? So again, you know, not losing sight that that it, um, as um, the state representative um, shared, that it, there is not one sort of single approach. This is all interrelated. Uh, the thing that stood out to me, because I've been involved in real estate um, you know, for a number of years, so I've seen those deed restrictions throughout my career um, and um, you know, knew that they no longer apply by, by federal law, but, but you see them a lot. But to see how stark it is between one neighborhood to another is something that had never had occurred to me. Um, the other thing I'd point out uh, that Kathleen did bring up, that, and I always point to Pearl as a, the, the entity in the development that, that, that solved this issue, was um, even beyond what was going on at the federal level and, and, and getting rid of the deep restrictions, is that the realtor community in San Antonio has always been hyper-oriented to the north side and it's basically redlined anything south of Hildebrand. 
And uh, I've been at King William since 83, heavily involved in the King William Association and the South Town organization. And um, you know, we were always amazed in doing studies and surveys out at the, out at the quarry to find out you know, what's the awareness of King William and South Town, how to get people down here to come to our shops and go to the restaurants and, and you know, at least get some life down there. And, you know, as long as 10 years ago, you do a survey out of the quarry and people would not, they don't know where King William is, they never heard of Southtown, it's just, uh, just amazing. And it wasn't until Pearl became such a big deal uh, that when people came to town, um, they could no longer tell, their, their realtor could no longer tell them that, that viable inner city housing uh, existed. You know, when anybody came to town, we used to hear in King William when people would get down there after being in town for five years, came to town, realtor told me nothing existed south of Hildebrand, took me out to the medical center, I've been miserable down in King William or Lavaca, and, it's, and things are great. Um, so it was really Pearl that, that, uh, that you know, kind of woke the city up to the fact that we have some great inner city neighborhoods. Uh, and because of that, because of Pearl, anybody who looks at Pearl or comes to town and looks at the inner city, they look at King William, they look at Lavaca, they look at Dignity Hill. And so that's, I think, part of why the issue of gentrification has really started to happen in San Antonio over the last, you know, probably five or six years. Um, so, yeah, it, aside from the red line that we discussed, there's a lot of other red line that's been going on over the, you know, in the history of San Antonio. I just want to make that point. So, uh, I've seen Christine's presentation as well uh, a few times, and, and what's interesting is the first time I saw it was um, Christine was presented to our Teach for America cohort. It was a group of uh, individuals that were becoming teachers, and most of them were out from outside of San Antonio. And I just love the fact that TFA would have this as part of their curriculum to help the teachers understand San Antonio. And I was here, it was my first week. And so I got a chance to see that presentation, and I immediately went to Christine and said, "Because I said, where's you know, where's has everybody seen this?" Um, and she said, "You know, no. I mean, it's kind of been you know, sort of a, a limited um, sort of presentation or a limited audience." And so we partnered together. And what I love is now, you know, I mean, she's out there. She's she's out on the road. And and I'll tell you, and I've seen this probably now probably my fourth time as well. And each time I see it, part of it is therapy for me because part of the challenge we have in our school district is sometimes it just feels like the challenges are just so overwhelming because the poverty is just so dense, it's so high. Um, we look at our academic results, especially compared to you know suburban districts like North, Central, Northeast, and it just feels really overwhelming. Um, so for me, it, 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 it gives me context um, it, it really motivates me to, you know, really push Christine and others to just really understand it. And for us, you know, we've now used, you know, sort of with this motivated us to really look at our families, the, the 50,000 plus children we serve, and we said, okay, so let's really understand what's going on. And Mohammed Chowdhury is my uh, chief innovation officer in the district, and you know, one of the things that, that we did is we said, okay, let's look at census data. Um, and let's look at, you know, this issue of poverty in our district uh, because, you know, we can see Christine's, you know, sort of historical perspective. And one of the things that we found, um, this is something we're going to talk about this week in my State of the District address, is that um, we have almost two-thirds of, you know, the high-poverty families in the county. Uh, these are families that are literally, you know, poverty based on the federal guidelines. If you combine us in Edgewood and Harlandale and South Sand, we have 82% of the families. And so that is the task, that is the challenge. Um, and it's interesting because some of my other colleagues will say, well, you know, in Northside and Northeast, we have poverty as well. Even in, even in um, you know, in, uh, in some other communities, I mean, the poverty is growing. And, you know, it's interesting because when, my, when I, we're building a strong team and some of the team is from outside of San Antonio and when they come here, I always, I always tell them, say, just drive around the city, like, just do me that favor, just, you know, just uh, tell me what you see. And they always tell me the same thing, I can't believe how stark the differences are between housing, between development, it's just so visible. And I gotta tell you, for somebody who's just been here two and a half years, like, I don't get it. 
I think what I mean by that, folks, is I don't understand how it could have become this bad and people didn't see it. And, and what I realized is that when you live in an area and you've grown up here, you really don't see it. And, and so because of that, I really pushed this thing. I said, well, people don't get it, they don't understand it. And it shouldn't be me coming in with others to you know, say, look at this, like, like it's not right. So for us, you know, it's just been a big motivator in our work that we're doing. So you know, we're creating new school models, we're, we're making sure those school models are being created with a certain design, because we want to make sure that we don't promote our own type of segregation, even in our own school models. Um, you know, as Cynthia said, we are working so hard to improve our existing schools, and we're, and we're seeing people respond. Um, and so again, uh, you know, more, more to that will come as, as we get more questions. So you can actually keep the mic down there. Um, can everybody hear me okay right now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, the next question I wanted to ask, since you mentioned housing stock, I want to bounce off of that. Uh, one, of our, one of our audience members had mentioned uh, the idea of an affordable uh, revolving housing loan or improvements. Um, Steve, I wanted, I wanted you to kind of uh, take this from the private side and with regard to housing stock and improving and um, the balance between affordable housing and quality housing, what is your perspective of that when it comes to gentrification or housing um, availability in San Antonio? Um, you know, I, I thought about the gentrification issue for a long time. I've always had this idea in my head of some kind of a, I always have it, I always call it myself, the Re Revitalization and Anti-Gentrification Act, which should be any of these uh, angles that you can think of to protect people that don't get forced out of their home by rising property values, uh, allow landlords to keep their rents where they want to keep them instead of having to jack them up in order to pay property taxes, uh, and or sell the house because it gets it gets taxed as the same value as a single family home. Um, and so the frustrating thing, and I'm on one of the, the subcommittees of the Housing Task Force, and we were at a, a session last week, and Michael Amoskita from Bear Appraisal District was talking about, um, you know, how the code is set up. Uh, and I've always known this, that, that commercial property is, is hyper undervalued versus single family homes. Um, and I always thought, well, if you could just pass, um, Pass laws to make Texas a disclosure state where you have to disclose your property values that would solve the problem. He made it clear there are a myriad of tricks and gimmicks in the code that allow commercial properties to be substantially undervalued. So all the work that we're trying to do to, uh, to solve the gentrification, people being forced out, people being able to build equity in their homes is diametrically opposed to all the things that you would do because of property taxes. And King William, the funny, the, the people who have lived there a long time have always known that you never paint the outside of your house. You know, you walk into a home and it's pristine, but outside it'll look like a teardown. Because yeah. the second you paint it, the second you fix your roof, yeah. property taxes are going up. And, uh, and it affects people at, at all levels. So, um, you know, I, I had asked the question, you know, what do we do? And I made a statement that San Antonio, it, it, and it's becoming a big deal all around the U.S., a big deal in Texas. I go to ULI. So the issue of gentrification and the affordable housing crisis and the talk about um, not just equal, but the equity, uh, looking at everything with an equity lens and how you bring things back to to a normal state is huge all across the U.S. So I made this, the comment that um, if ever there was a perfect storm for pressure to come to bear on a state legislator to do something about that, now would be it. You know, you do it on a you know, revenue neutral basis and property taxes for residential would drop by half, I guarantee you. Um, and then, you know, all this stuff would, you, you would, you'd be starting, you'd be getting somewhere. And so I think the number one thing that, that the city needs to do is get the best lobbyists and if it takes five years, 10 years, 15 years, get on it now and, and link up with all the other people, and the groups just like this in Austin, Dallas, Houston, everywhere, uh, to try and make that change. So that's, you know, that's uh, the one thing that I would say. Um, you know, to me, that's, that's the elephant in the room. Um, 
And, and I've personally experienced that myself. I used to have a little duplex on Callahan. I had a triplex on Adams Street. And not to go into investment you know, analysis and the rest of it, but when you get to the point that you know you go in to, to get appraised and they don't look at the value of your property based on your income, they look at it as there's a house across the street that sold for three hundred thousand, you're worth three hundred thousand, it's like that's three quarters of my rent on property taxes. So what do you do? You sell. The other thing that is accelerating the process is that uh, in the old days, King William Lavaca, people would buy a house, young couple, and you'd fix it up over a 15, 20 year period. Now, you can't compete with the flip industry. There are so many people that are out there just ready to, to pounce on, on any house that's getting ready to come on the market that buy it for 150,000, put 50,000, put it back on the market for 300,000. So that is drastically accelerating the process. And then the other thing on the rental side is that any neighborhood that becomes remotely interesting or, you know, or, uh, or attractive, close to downtown, whatever, um, if people who have the small scale, three, four, six, you know, sixplex, um, have that face that, that tax issue, um, they're going to Airbnb. And 15 years ago, the King William Associates spent a lot of time and energy coming up with a BNB ordinance because we were being overrun with BNBs. Why the city didn't just take that and say, "Here's our BNB ordinance. You're an Airbnb. Here's the, here's the you know here's the the, uh, the the rule." I don't know, but we're now going to have a slew of grandfathered Airbnbs if and when the city comes up with a plan and puts it in place. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening that works against everything that we're trying to do. Um, and it can make you, you know, um, kind of, you know, pessimistic. we were just talking about, you've got to be optimistic, but it's, you know, it's, it's sometimes in the face of all this, it, it can be kind of, you know, can tend to be pessimistic, yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's, you know, that's where I, that's kind of where I come from. Um, you know, the, there's been a lot of work that happened after Katrina in New Orleans, and I think San Antonio and New Orleans are very similar. I call San Antonio is kind of the, the uh, German, Mexican version of the, of the French, uh, African-American New Orleans. Um, and there's been a lot of work to see how you can create affordable housing and how you can you know, take the way that people have maintained their homes over the years and kind of use those same mechanisms the same way that they figured out how to make their homes work and maintain it, and keep that working in the same way without ruling it out via codes and building codes and that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of great ideas, a lot of smart people, a lot of people that have been, you know, that have been working on solving the problem. But until we take care of property taxes, um, you know, the second anything nice starts to happen, anything good starts to happen in your neighborhood, is everybody's going to want to put on the brakes, or it's going to start forcing people out. And that's just the nature of you know of, of economics. You know, there's there's no keeping things the same. Another King William story is I always joke that people that moved in in 1970 wanted it to be like it was in 1970. People that moved in in 1980 wanted it to be like it was in 1980, and and so on down the guy who moved in five years ago wants to be like it was five years ago. But economies kind of balance on the head of a pin. And if it's not, if you're not moving forward, you're falling back. There's no stasis. It's just that or the other. Um, so we have to kind of decide if we're going to, you know, if we're really going to get this thing going and solve a lot of these issues. That, you know, there's going to be a, there's going to be, you know, some difficult choices and some hurt feelings and and that sort of thing, but it's, to me, it's kind of one or the other. So, since you mentioned state legislature mm -hmm. and you mentioned District One, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll I'll be quick, but I, I think you're right. The, the environment that I'm in in Austin is not a, a friendly environment. But I did I did want to let you guys know of some of the things that we're trying to do to that end. But I will be very clear with you that. The only way that it happens is both if enough people care about it. What's really interesting about all these issues, though, they should give you some hope, is if you think about them politically, they don't really belong to one party or the other. When we're talking about property taxes, in some ways, that's the most bipartisan issue you can get a hold of, and we just need to sell it that way. So very quickly, one, if we fix or do better with school finance in a significant way, that would allow some school districts 
to lower, to some degree, their property taxes, which provides some level of property tax relief. The second is we're not a sales disclosure state, which means that when a property, whether it's commercial or, or residential, is sold, there's not a requirement to share what the price was. What happens because of that, especially on commercial properties, is that those, those properties get underassessed, and then those people, because they're often of means, fight that assessment, and what happens is they don't care nearly as much as what they should be on property taxes, leaving residential homeowners to bear the burden. That's number two. Number three, we talked about pools. There was a bill that we got all the way through the House and the Senate and was vetoed by our great governor, Greg Abbott, which was a homestead preservation district, which would have allowed the city to draw a boundary, sort of like a residential TERS, draw a boundary around certain areas, collect the property taxes that were over what they were before, and then use that money for whatever they wanted, as long as the charter allowed it. So it could have been, it could have been uh, investment in infrastructure, it could have been low interest loans, it could have been a variety of things. It could have been used to keep people in their homes. When we're talking about gentrification, we all might mean different things in our mind when we hear it. So for the purpose of the next one, then I'm done with the, with the tools that we're working on. All, all the things I'm talking about, there are bills that exist that have been filed and gone nowhere or been killed. These are not ideas that we haven't tried. We're currently trying them now. So for the purpose of the last one, I'm talking about making sure that people who own their homes aren't taxed out. Right, that's, that's the phenomenon I'm talking about with this next one. And that is a, a, a legacy homeowner tax break of some sort. The way it would work, I don't have the numbers just yet, I need an economist to help me out. But it would be, if you have been in your home for X number of years, and, it, and it's owner occupied, then whether after a certain point, whether it's a temporal point, meaning you've been there for a certain amount of time, or your property taxes have risen so violently that it's doubled or tripled, then you're entitled to the kind of break that we give people when they hit 65, or something like that. The purpose being making sure that people who own their home, especially those who own their home outright, can stay in it. In, in, in my mind, there's a lot of indignities that we can pass on to people, but one of the most undignified things that can happen is being forced to leave a home that you own, right? And so, I just want to point this out that, that these are all things that we're working on, these are all things where bills exist, these are all things that the legislature can and has the ability and the power to do. In many ways, they are the broad scope, large scope solutions or attempted solutions that Dr. Drennan mentioned. But if you want to talk about it further, we can because these are not just ideas where at the end of our conversation or after we've had the cup of coffee, we go back and there's nothing to do. These are actual, real, these are action items that exist. Sure. Why did the governor veto that bill you call the residential tours to help us understand what's the argument that was going in the other direction? Why did, why did the governor veto the homestead? Why did he say he veto? Or why, why do you think? It's so there's a public and a private answer, right? <laughs> the, 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 the private answer is that it was fully sponsored by Democrats and um, Republicans who have high tax districts voted for it begrudgingly because they knew their, their districts wouldn't like it. Now, God forbid they actually represent people that, that they represent in their districts. But the, but the public part was that that should not be the goal of the cities to interfere with the market, that the market will sort itself out and this is essentially uh, market manipulation, and that that uh, fell afoul of the general principles of the state of Texas. Um, me, Anna Romero, who worked in my office during that time, sitting in the back, who now works for Saha. Did I get that right? Exactly. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So that was that was the answer. Awesome. Um, voters, voters, y'all want to chime in? You don't have to. Well, I, I, maybe this is a, a great sort of opportunity to also describe um, what the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force is doing and you know, the, the approach that we're taking. And, and, and basically, you know, the, so the Mayor created the, um, this Policy Housing Task Force to uh, address uh, the great need that we have in our city um, to create housing that is affordable to all segments of the population with a focus on um, households that are um, really struggling economically 
And just a couple of statistics that I think are important for, for all of us to know, you know, in terms of sort of the baseline. Um, I think over the last five years, uh, property values um, have increased about 48%, but income has not increased, or, or hasn't kept up, I should say, it's increased by 15%. So hence, you know, you have the cost of rental housing and home ownership going up, but wages not keeping up. And, and you know, some of these you know, points were raised um, during Dr. Brennan's um, Q&A that um, what are we doing to ensure that uh, the limited public tools or public investments or public incentives that we have are directed towards creating more affordability? And so the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force is exploring um, these five policy areas we've uh, created five areas of focus uh, to help come up with a set of recommendations that we hope will allow us to turn the corner, to create more affordable housing, to address some of these issues of um, preventing displacement, um, protecting older neighborhoods, uh, but also uh, recognizing that it's not just a housing solution, right? it really requires um, collaborating across sectors. Uh, so we created five policy areas. The first is um, ensuring that we are providing, under, really understanding the need to provide housing and services for special populations. We have individuals that are homeless, that are chronically homeless, individuals that are aging out of the foster care system, um, individuals that are aging in place that maybe need a different type of housing environment. Uh, so we're really interested in coming up with solutions to tackle that. Um, that space. The second uh, area of focus for us is looking at the private um, market and the private sector. One way, uh, you know, we recognize that there are not enough federal resources or state resources to create 150,000 units of affordable housing. And so the question for us is, is what can we do to incentivize the private market to create affordable housing? What are some of maybe the regulatory barriers that are in the way? And so, you know, this uh, question that was brought up earlier that um, the mayor and the council have suspended, you know, automatic incentives um, gives us the opportunity to take a pause and to look at how these public um, incentives are being directed to create affordability. The third area of focus uh, is around looking at new funding and financing mechanisms, um, looking at you know, what, what more can we do to, to bring in more dollars you know, to assist. Um, the fourth area, and I'm going by memory, so help me, Victoria, if I forget. Yeah, so I mentioned funding and finance, a coordinated housing system. During our conversation with the city staff, who have been wonderful, um, and in conversation with uh, the nonprofits and the for-profit housing um, development community, we recognize that as a city, we don't have a coordinated, integrated housing system. So, in, in some sense, you know, we're all doing some part, but we're not doing it in a coordinated fashion. So, we're interested in figuring out, you know, can we come up with a coordinated housing system that allows for us to be smarter about how we invest and then track the impact that we're having. And then the last... Um, neighborhoods. Neighborhoods, yes. And the last... Um, exactly. That's great. You know, so uh, it's, it is about uh, understanding the tools that communities um, that are already in communities or the tools that we need to um, scale to address um, you know, the issues that have come up when you're investing in older neighborhoods. Um, someone mentioned earlier that there are conversations about a relocation assistance program, and you know, um, I think it was couched in the sense of you know, we need to be thinking more comprehensively, and I agree. I think we need to look at what does an anti-displacement policy look like? And then a subcomponent is relocation assistance, right? So I think the way that we look at these things has to start from the perspective that traditionally the market, the, the you know, uh, does not think about poor people. They don't come at it from that perspective. And so if we come up with a set of policies that 
allows for us to recognize the history, to understand that this is an issue of poverty also and inequality, then I really believe that you know the policy recommendations through these five buckets um, will enable us to, to be more comprehensive and to be more system thinking um, from maybe what we've done in the past. Uh, let, me, let me get a Q&A at the end. I just want to make sure we get through a lot of this stuff. Um, so, one of the, uh, and my wife and I talk about this quite a bit, one of the things that we talk about when we, we discuss the solutions or gentrification, whatever, um, is a matter of, there's been a concern and there's a lot of uh, vocal advocates about making sure that low-income households are, low-income individuals have a place that we have you know, housing for them, that we have a space for them in our city, and they're not being pushed around. The discussion that we often don't have when it comes to gentrification is how do we ensure that low-income individuals don't, aren't stuck in a cycle of generational poverty? And I, and I really like to, so my favorite topic uh, in this, all this stuff is education, uh, simply because in my perspective that is the foundation of growth in any sector um, when it comes to these discussions. So Pedro, I'm going to toss the mic in your direction uh, and kind of get your perspective. And I, and I want you, you, you mentioned um, recapture the other day when we spoke. I want you to kind of tie that into this, but I want you to kind of kind of key in on how education is truly a great equalizer, right? <laughs> sure. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so first of all, you know, one of the things that and I want to make clear is that when we see, so what, what I always remind our staff and I remind the community, when you look at public ed institutions, we're, we're one of the few organizations that gets, that sees the families on a continuous basis. I always uh, say that we see everything. So we see when families are doing well, we see when families are not. Uh, we have children for at least seven hours a day. I mean, if you think about it, what other public institution gets that kind of access, right? Because hospitals even don't even get that access. They, they see a patient for a certain amount of time, and then after that, they're gone. Um, we are, it's continuous for us. And, and because of that, you know, one of the things that we thought, talk about is how do we make sure that we're, what role are we playing, especially knowing the context that exists here in San Antonio, and what we talk about is how do we make sure that we are part of the solution that families have access to quality education because, like Brian, I truly believe that um, there's a lot of things that need to be done, whether it's in housing, whether it's social, if there's social supports, but at the end of the day, if that family is gonna escape poverty, if they're gonna build wealth, um, education is a significant part, and in some cases, and like in my case, in my family, it was what did make the difference. Um, and so, a couple of things we're doing. So first of all, we are raising expectations at a very high level. We are making it very clear that not only are our children going to graduate from our high schools, but they're going to be going to college. I get a lot of pushback on that because there's a lot of people that say, why are you so obsessed with college? Because, you know, not everybody should go to college. And I say, well, you know, let's have that conversation because if you're coming from a middle class or upper class family, all right. I respect that. I can have that conversation within your family. I'm curious to see if all of you agree on that, but put that aside. But if you're coming from a high poverty family, especially the families that I serve, I say this very clearly. I don't think our families are going to be okay if they don't obtain higher education. Now, whether they should go to Harvard or whether they should go to, to San Antonio College, that's a different conversation, right? But, but in terms of them going beyond high school, I don't think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to end up in a minimum pay job. I think they're going to continue to uh, continue the cycle of poverty. This high, you know, this, this, these neighborhoods that have this dilapidated housing, they're going to continue to live there. I just don't see them improving their, their, their conditions. So because of that, you know, we double down on this. Uh, and, and it's interesting, in, in the last two years, we saw the number of students graduating, increased from 80 to 85 percent, but more importantly, we're seeing more and more students going to college. We've increased the number of students going to top tier one universities from 2 percent of our graduates to now 7 percent. And I mean, and we're, remember, we're, and we're pushing on this very hard. And so for us, 
Um, you know, does it mean that, you know, we still have a ways to go? Um, because I'll tell you, we are now at the point where we're looking at granularly at every single school, every single neighborhood, and we're asking the question, do the children in these neighborhoods have the access and the chance to be successful? And because of that, we're trying very, you know, different models. We're creating different programs. We're creating different partnerships. And so for us, um, you know, that's the direction we want to go. And, and I will tell you, again, we have a ways to go, but it's interesting. Like, we're seeing things like, uh, we started universally screening students who uh, were advanced in first and fifth grade. And so what happens, these are the sort of secrets that people don't tell you. So when people have means and they have children, they will make sure, God bless them, I mean, I, you know, I'm the same way, to make sure their children have every opportunity they can, right? So for example, in very wealthy neighborhoods, they make sure that if their children has a chance to be identified as gifted or advanced, they make sure that happens. They'll pay for tests, they'll be able to do, you know, they'll do these things. And high poverty families, they don't know. They just don't know. So we started doing universal screening. We increased the number of children that we identified as advanced or gifted from four to six percent and by the way, the children were already smart. In fact, some of the families said, well, Pedro, you know that. I'm so glad you're doing this because I didn't realize that my son was, was gifted. I thought he was just a little off, you know, because he was acting out, he was you know, not behaving well in school, and all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, like, like he was just bored. He was just really bored, and, and we didn't have, you know, again, and so now the school and the parent are working together to make sure that child is challenged. So, so I use that as an example. Let me talk a little bit about property tax because Let's face it, you know, it's, it's, you know, when you look at your tax bill, San Antonio ISP, I know, stands out very quickly because we represent more than half of your property taxes. Here's one of the things that's really frustrating for me, and, and Diego knows this, uh, is that what I hate is that when your property taxes go up, none of that revenue directly increases our, our budget. In other words, so when your taxes go up every year, and I know they go up all the time, um, literally, that revenue, in essence, goes to Austin. We used to think that it was used for education, right? So I used to tell people, well, when you go visit, you know, another community like in El Paso or another a rural area, make sure they thank you because you're paying for their education, right? Because you're subsidizing because they don't have enough property tax wealth, and so that's how the state makes it work. So I said, make sure they thank you. Well, then I learned later that that isn't even always what's happening that they're using this money for other things other than education because rather than say, and be honest and say, hey, we don't have an income tax, and that's okay, like that's cool that we don't have an income tax, but you gotta come up with revenue somehow, and rather than tax, you know, having a business tax, rather than increasing sales taxes, we're gonna just leverage property taxes, and that's what's happening. And so now you see a movement that's happening, actually starting in the northern part of the state, in Dallas, and in, uh, in suburbs of Dallas, they're starting now to just, I mean, they're so angry. They're actually putting out videos and flyers and talk, trying to get people, anybody who will listen and say, you know, start protesting this because this is wrong. And so, and so you just need to know that that, that that exists. So sadly, we are capped in terms of what our revenues are. So, so in these, by the way, a lot of these are formula driven and these formulas, some of them have been updated in 20, 30 years. So think about that for a second. So we've been funding, in many cases, the same way, even though our state is not poorer, or in some cases we have all these challenges, some of these ones are 20 to 30 years old, and the state refuses to update them because now it's so expensive. And instead of using this extra resources that are coming from your property taxes and using them to fix that, they're saying, well, now we have other, other parts of the state budget that we have to fill. So that's, that's what's happening. In the meantime, what that's forced us to do is to look at and say, okay, so how do we make sure that we are getting the resources that we need for, for our schools, and so we're leveraging more than ever, you know, and thank God we have a very generous community of philanthropic donors. Uh, we did pass two ballot questions, so that at least we could keep some of that revenue local, uh, but that required, again, you had to approve that, and, and again, you know, for us, our goal is just to make sure that, again, that we can invest in these needs and again, we're starting to see some, some very uh, fruitful and some, some very, uh, we, we see some potential of what we're seeing, especially like I said, uh, the number of kids right now, last year we had in our graduating class, uh, we had over 54% of our students attending college, more than half going to universities, that was the first time ever that we ever saw that. I have four students right now that are at Middlebury in Vermont, I have a student at the University of Alaska, uh, so we have students at record levels at all the high, uh, all of our top universities here in Texas. Um, I'm going to jump over to Diego. I know he's 
No, no. I mean, I think I think that that, that education is a big part of it. I, mean, I, I feel the same way. The way I see it is, you know, education is sort of like milk and coffee. The more of it you add, the more everything else changes. But the reason the reason I wanted to jump in is because I I'm really really interested in almost myopic about making sure that you guys know that these are the things we can actually work on right now. So this year there's going to be a committee that studies the way the state funds public schools. There's a school finance committee that the government put together. I'm on it. Don't ask me how I ended up there, but I am. But, but my point is that there is a conversation about changing the way we, we fund public schools right now. But just to make his point, think of it this way. When we settled on this form of school finance in the 80s, poor students, and the way that we measured poverty was about 25%. So arguably, they were a special population. Today, they're over 60%. So over 60% of the students we have in, in public schools in Texas are poor, and yet we haven't changed the way that we fund the public schools, and the state has decreased its, its contribution to public ed, which is squeezing the property owners, which is resulting in the conversation we're having now. But again, and I'm gonna pass it off, but the point I'm making is this is not just a a session where we're voicing our frustrations, I am telling you that there are individual things happening right now that we can all focus on and try to get done. It is not impossible, it's just hard. Yeah, to follow up on Diego's point, you know, as some of the federal laws are changing and some of the state laws are changing, um, what we're really working on here at a local level is engaging passionate people to come be involved, right? To um, keep your elected officials accountable, to serve on boards and commissions, and um, you know, for the first time in a while, we had an, an unprecedented record number of people um, apply for boards and commissions this year. We had over, I think it was 60 applicants apply for the planning commission, which is a lot of time. Um, it's a lot of work. And so much so that we had to create a special group of subcommittee members to uh, weed out some of the board applications to, to, to just go through the interview process. And so I think what's really important, what's really great about all of you being here, and I recognize a lot of the faces in the room because you also come to the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force meetings, you come to other community events, is that part, part of the reason that Brian set up this panel is to get people to come up with solutions, right? So we have wonderful people like Pedro working at the school district level, we have Diego, we have Lourdes, we have Steve in the private sector, and, and we also need help as well. And so a lot of that is getting um, neighbors involved and also being welcome to high quality development that benefits low income families. Um, sometimes what we see, so in my prior job, um, I work in the private sector um, in real estate, so we would be representing um, high quality um, affordable housing developers trying to um, utilize um, some of the low income housing tax credit programs in order to bring um, affordable housing into neighborhoods where there weren't any options. And it was a, such a difficult process at the front end to get the entitlements like the zoning um, that was needed to make those developments happen, that a lot of the developments would end up failing. And then there would be, as a result, those tax credits, because it's a very competitive process, would be awarded to another community. Um, which, for an affordable housing development, you know, paying $50,000 in entitlement fees on the front end is really difficult and ultimately, you know, affects the overall affordability of a project. And so I think. The reason I'm telling you that is so that way, um, you know, we do see quality development coming because we want quality development that benefits people at all income levels. We don't, you know, historically, and this is part of what Dr. Bannon was saying, a lot of our you know, low income housing is just dilapidated housing, right? And so uh, people deserve to live with dignity and to live in quality housing. And so I think part of that is having that conversation, being open um, to, to um, working with um, developers and other um, entities that are coming into um, your neighborhood, and then also you know keeping them and your elected officials accountable. I think it's really important as we're as we're working on these things. Yeah. 
Well, just, you know, building, I think, on what, what Victoria said, you know, participation, getting involved, critically important. And we have, you know, we have some great institutions here in San Antonio that, that are also um, doing a lot of great work. You know, the local public housing authority, the San Antonio Housing Authority, leading um, a really comprehensive um, neighborhood revitalization effort in the east side. You know, nothing is... What's important about you know that approach to the choice neighborhoods is that this is the first time that there is a look at the three sort of major components of um, what it takes to be able to revitalize public housing. Traditionally, under Hope Six, um, meant, you know the the approach was to basically demolish public housing, replace it with um, nice looking you know housing without a real um, sense of understanding of the impact that that had on um, residents and also without um, a one-for-one -one replacement. Under, you know, the, the model that um, Saha is leading, and, and this is not just, you know, here locally, but across the country, there's a focus on replacement of, of public housing, there's a focus on investing on individuals, but there's also an understanding that within the neighborhood, investing in, you know, education, in bringing in business, um, new businesses, and investing in infrastructure is critically important to sustain that level of investment. The, the other piece um, that I think is also really important to the point of um, being an optimistic and you know, what are the, the things that are occurring, uh, we have a number of nonprofit housing developers and for-profit housing developers that are in this space of creating affordable housing the model and the approach in you know, most more recent years has been to create what is called mixed income housing, where you have housing that is subsidized and housing that is market rate, you know, bringing uh, diverse socioeconomic groups. And I think that's you know a model that allows for us to to um, to be creative, and it's, it's a model that needs you know to continue. Um, so, so all that to say is that there is good work that is happening. Um, but I do think that it is important um, for us, now more than ever, to ensure that we are um, maybe working smarter across sectors so that, you know, when you're thinking about housing, um, that there's also an understanding that housing is connected to health, for example. Um, my role now within the university health system has enabled me to look at health from a very different perspective. Where you live affects your health, health outcomes. If you don't have access to a safe, decent, quality housing environment, if you don't have, if you don't feel safe where you live, if you can't walk, if you don't have access to a park, all of those things affect your health outcomes. And so there's opportunities for housing and health to come together. There's opportunities for housing and education to come together. And so I think, you know, this is really a, an important sort of moment for us, um, continuing to work across sectors, continuing to be involved and engaged, and you know, really being solution oriented. So, there's a we we seem to be on kind of a theme now of ecosystem, um, where everybody has to work with each other in order to come up with a solution because there are no silver bullets to to any of the issues that we are running into uh, with regard to gentrification or inequity. Um, Steve, I'm going to toss the mic back to you from the private side because, I mean, these folks are, you know, in, in the public sector. So, from the private side, and, and I do cybersecurity uh, day to day, that's, my, that's who pays me. Um, but all this other stuff is kind of on the side because you can't just go through life and not contribute back to society. Um, so, I wanted to get your reflection on how difficult is it to spread your time between professional and then also contributing to society in the public sense. Um, yeah, I've always, um, and, and there's a lot of folks who are in the industry here locally who I think who feel the same way. One thing that's interesting or, or nice about San Antonio is that, um, you know, you don't come to San Antonio, don't come back to San Antonio because you want to make money. Um, you know, for all the talk of San Antonio being the seventh largest city in Texas, we're the fourth largest economy in, or seventh largest in the U.S., we're the 
economically we're the fourth largest in Texas. So you don't come here to make money. Most of the people that are coming back that are, that are local developers, local guys that are trying to do things here and there, um, do it because they believe in San Antonio and they're trying to, uh, you know, from their standpoint, if you like, make things better, try and, you know, <coughs> lift, you know, elevate us and, and keep us in the race. Um, so we don't fall back and become that, you know, in league with, not that there's anything wrong with El Paso, but, um, you know, it could easily become a love like El Paso, Laredo, as opposed to keeping up with an Austin, Dallas, Houston. Um, so I think, you know, just personally, speaking personally, and then for a lot of the other folks that are involved in Urban Land Institute, they really feel like, you know, they have to be involved. They have to um, sit on panels, go to charrettes, try and do what they can to, to you know, keep San Antonio moving along in the right way. And one of the things we say at the Urban Land Institute or, or locally is that um, the nice thing about it is it gives you exposure to all the other markets and all the other cities in, in the United States and even you know, uh, uh, worldwide. And so what we say is because San Antonio grows so much slower than the other Texas markets is we have the chance to do it right. Um, to grow in a way where we don't lose our soul, we don't become an Austin, um, we don't become a Dallas, we don't become a Houston. Um, but we see what they did right, and we can model after the same things, we can learn from their mistakes and take care of them and address them before we get to that point. Um, so the two kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, uh, spend, you know, at times I've spent, you know, probably 20% of my hours on, you know, either it's King William or Southtown or, um, or, you know, uh, ULI, which I consider also be kind of a, a public deal. Um, and it's just, it's just part of what you, part of what you do, um, in my opinion. Anybody else want to expand on the theme of ecosystem and how we can better work together in our different from our different perspectives and Well, I will say that, you know, and my wife and I talk about this all the time, that one of the reasons that we feel, you know, optimistic that, you know, we can transform our district and, and really improve educational outcomes is that there, there is a, there's an ecosystem. Um, I don't know if it's a window and how long we have in that window, but it, it does feel like the conditions are set. Um, you know, I feel this myself personally because the level of support we get from our community the level of support that we're getting even from you know our state commissioner, from our mayor, uh, from our county commissioners. I mean, they all want us to succeed. Um, I find it very easy to collaborate here. It's not always easy. I've been in other cities. I grew up in Chicago. Um, I, I live in, in uh, both Las Vegas and in Reno and Nevada. And, and you know, in some cities, it's just easier to collaborate than others. I think San Antonio is one of the easiest, frankly. Um, I don't see a lot of the egos, and maybe it's you know it's on the side. Or I don't see a lot of the other politics. Maybe again, I just, I'm naive and I, it's on the side, but it's it's not as visible. Um, I think the challenge here is one us all having the same context, which is why I'm a big advocate for for Christine to be out presenting and showing the historical perspective. I think the other is uh, a real honest conversation about policies and decisions. And, you know, and, and I'll just use one little example. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, it was on the radio maybe a few months ago about uh, Ernst the Young, who was going to be expanding in San Antonio, and they were going to expand significantly. It was like 500 jobs, these were all well-paying jobs, 60,000, 80,000 and above. And I'm like, great, right? And so, because they have a small presence now, here and now, and, and I know that world very well. And so I know it has a lot of other benefits that will come with it because of the kind of clients they serve, etc. And then I learned that, well, but they're already in Northside. And, and they're gonna be expanding out in Northside. And I just thought, you know, and I, and I saw one of, the, one of the commissioners, and he was like, he was so surprised. I think, wasn't that great that we're having Ernst Young expand? I said, yeah, commissioner, but why, why, why wouldn't they expand in downtown? Why in Northside? I mean, my God, folks, every time I go out, uh, out down 1087, if I see another crane, I mean, the cranes are everywhere. Please, if you just go out there, or you go out down 1604, the cranes are everywhere. And the reason I say that, it's not because, you know, those are great communities, that are nothing against the development in those areas, but if you really want to tackle the issue of wealth, of inequality, you got these people, our, our, our community has to have access to jobs. 
And, and, and you have to have good paying jobs because if the economy doesn't change, and most of the jobs that are available are low paying jobs like in our hotels, in our fast food places, in our malls, I mean, that's what I see our families you know, having access to. And so, unfortunately, when you have development and it's happening outside of our area, it just promotes segregation. And so, so definitely housing is a huge part of it, but I think it's something that, again, you know, and, and, you know, and, again, I just, and I just think it's just something that I feel that our, both our city and our county have to look at, and frankly, I think they just have to be thoughtful about it. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to jump into you right now. Um, I um, so, from the city side, um, one of the things that, um, so I'm on the board for the Central Partnership, um, which we make downtown move, um, but one of the things going off of the, 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 the speak of downtown and sprawl, uh, from the city side, Diego, just remind me of Decade of Downtown, uh, was a big effort. When it comes to this uh, lens of equity and what we're gonna, working off of for the comprehensive plan and bond programs, how does the city tie into uh, that sprawl effect and kind of reducing it? Right, so um, a lot of that ties back to the city's um, Essay Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan. Um, so this current council has gotten a lot of attention about um, you know, using an equity lens as it makes decisions with regards to the budget. Um, but I think you know, even prior to this council, if you look at the Essay Tomorrow Plan, the idea of expanding equity in places where people had access to jobs, where they could live, work, and play throughout the city, um, not just downtown or not just on the north side, um, but in 13 regional centers um, throughout the city, with you know, one of the um, kind of important parts of bringing equity to San Antonio, right? So instead of just investing in downtown or just, um, you know, Encouraging development outside of the city limits. It's how do we how do we manage growth? How do we manage growth sustainably? And um, how do we ensure that um, our entire city is benefiting and um, being able to access um, areas of opportunity uh, within their own communities? And so that's kind of the basis of our comprehensive plan. Um, and as you see that being implemented, um, you'll start to notice the idea. Uh, the plan is to have um, things like our economic development policies, um, like our incentive policies, to align with those um, targeted areas, um, richer centers down the town. So that's kind of one of the ways uh, that they're looking at um, helping bring that investment um, to different areas. Excellent. Um, Christine, if I could get you for one second. I wanted to, can you speak on just very briefly economic mobility? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just kind of give us a basic overview. Call, yeah. What I would call social mobility? <laughs> yeah, what about. She's like, I was done for the day, Brian. What about, what about it? Can you kind of just kind of give us a basic definition of economic mobility and how it fits in the conversation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so he's using economic mobility and I would use social mobility for the same, thing, for the yeah. same term. Um, American dream, you'll do better than your parents, right? They, they, they had a certain income level, you're going to have a, a higher income level of, uh, uh, above inflation. And, and currently in the United States, not just here in here, here specifically, but in the United States, that's been shown to be reversing in that in that that we are not socially mobile any longer from generation to generation. And in fact, most, it's, it's, especially with the millennial generation, probably will not do better than their parents did. Why? Because the, that, especially with the shrinkage, shrinkage in the middle class, right? So there's not, so there isn't those abilities in terms of income for one thing, but now this wealth thing is the other one is that because the wealth is the long term, is that that's like how you buy the house and how you get the better education. And with real estate doing what it's doing right now, we, and we don't understand that fully. And actually, it's part of like a full equity package. It's like, but real estate has become the new investment. It's stocks, bonds, but it's really real estate. And, it's, and so a lot of us can't afford to get into the real estate market anymore. We can't accumulate wealth. Social mobility, no longer. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so going off of that, I would like to go down the line and get from each of you 
what is your, not favorite solution, but what is your number one mode of addressing the issue of social mobility and trying to flip that on its head to where we are going back to being able to make more than our parents? Um, yeah. <coughs> I'll just keep mine short. If I had to provide a big one, I, I think it's improving public education. I sort of gave you the numbers and the outline before. I think the more that we can do to tee our kids up to do better and make sure that they can make progress, that that's, that is the one surefire way to do it. And in our city in particular, that's very much the San Antonio story, someone getting education and coming back and doing more than, than their parents are able to. So that's, that's my point. Yeah, this is a, this is not an easy question. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that education is really important. I think for um, the millennial generation, you know, I can only speak to first-hand experiences that I've had, but um, it's just, you know, the um, large amount of debt that we're undertaking in order to fund um, our um, post-high school edu education, if you do pursue it, is large. Um, it affects your debt to income. Um, ratio, it affects the amount of equity you have available to purchase property. Um, I myself am not a property owner, so I don't pay property taxes because um, I rent. Um, a lot of that has to do with being able to um, afford to have the cash on hand in order to make that purchase because I am paying off a student loans, which were a result of being able to fund my education. It's a really tough question, uh, Brian. Um, so I would say that we have to figure out how to eradicate poverty. I mean, how, how do we reduce poverty? Because really, I think that's at the core of everything that you know that we're discussing. And that's, you know, um, there's a lot of different approaches, I guess, to that, you know, from education. But, you know, of course, also as a, as a housing person, I would say, you know, investing in affordable housing and investing in affordable housing that allows us to recognize that there are, um, really that we have a moral ob obligation to take care of, um, of members of our society that um, fall on hard times. You know, we saw, I saw that firsthand when I, you know, of course, worked in public housing. Um, the average, I think most of you know that the median income here in San Antonio is you know, about $50,000. In public housing, um, the, to be able to qualify for public housing or Section 8, and you know, really the program is designed to target 75% of all families making under 30% of AMI. So for a family of four, that's about $25,000. But what I saw when I was there at the Public Housing Authority is that a family of four, on average, was making about $15,000 a, a year. Um, so, so we have to recognize that affordable housing that allows for individuals to live with dignity, to, lead, to live in a place that is you know, safe and sanitary, but also that allows for them to connect, to connect to education, to connect to services, to connect to employment opportunities, is um, also equally important. And um, as you know, Secretary Gustman used to say when, when he stepped into the Department of Housing and Urban Development as the secretary, he renamed that entire department, or he couched his term that HUD was the Department of Opportunity, and that we should think about housing as a platform for opportunity. And that you know is the lens that I look, that, that I embrace and that I use you know in the work that I do um, around housing. Um, you know, I I go back to, to solving the property tax issue is is one of the main things that needs to be addressed because as I said before, anything we try to do to to improve the inner city and improve our inner city neighborhoods, the values are going to go up and it's a double-edged sword. Uh, aside from that, education, and, and we have a lot of economic analysis and economy people come through and talk to you a lot, and everybody says the same thing. Education, education, education. And San Antonio invests in a lot of good public works. The, what's happened with the, the river south of uh, downtown has been absolutely transformative to, you know, you see families out there who you know were sitting on a couch a week ago who are out riding bikes and doing that sort of thing. but. Anytime some of these other deals come up, like a baseball stadium downtown, if there's 50 million to do a baseball stadium, there's 50 million to go into 
education and solving the social ills of uh, some of those families that prevent those kids from being able to learn when they go to a good school. Um, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Um, one of the things that I have found that's, you know, a plus about the you know, gentrification of, of King William and Lavaca is that um, when I moved into King William, we had, we had El Mirador as a restaurant, and we had the highest concentration of methadone clinics in the city, all within our, within our neighborhood, and walking distance. Um, and I would think the kids at Brack you know, how motivational is that to walk to school and that's what you're walking past? Uh, and now you go to Lock at King William, South County, and you see, you know, all the local restaurants, the people that are, that are working there. And if you do go there, ask any of your servers, any of the people that are working there, and seven out of 10 of them went to Brack. And while they're going to, while they're working there, they're going to SAC or they're going to UTSA or, or whatever. So that's a, that's a huge deal. Uh, and there's something in the paper today talking about, yes, we're starting to get housing and there's gentrification on the east side, but where's the economic development? And, and I'll just tell you, it takes bodies and it takes a long time. Um, up till six years ago, you could lay down in the you know, middle of South Alamo on a Sunday and nobody would hit you. Um, and today, you know, it's stop start getting down the street on a Sunday morning. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just up the thing. But it was bad for a long time. So. It takes bodies and people to keep after it, and that's you know, density. Um, you know, I've always said before, the only way to get housing costs down is smaller units and more of them for a project. We have to all be willing to accept density, be willing to accept new people in your neighborhood. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, all that's starting to come. USA moving 2,000, however many thousands of people they are downtown, there's been a a huge endorsement of uh, our downtown and the, and the fact that things are starting to happen in our neighborhoods because that's where the young people want to be. They don't want to be out of I-10 and 1604 anymore and people are starting to, starting to wake up and see that. People in the, in the, the, uh, uh, in the in, in industry. Um, so all that bodes well, but we got to solve that tax problem before it you know, crushes it. So for us, um, it really is, you know, I would say twofold. One is really changing the conversation about expectations and what where students are going to go. And, and when, again, you know, I've been very clear from day one that we are going to have more students graduating, more students going to college, more students graduating from college. Uh, we're going to be very intentional about if a student can get into a tier one Ivy League school, they're going to get into a tier one Ivy League school. Um, even if our students that are struggling and they, you know, you know, so, you know, I have siblings who didn't go to universities, they went to the community college system. Even with that, we're talking to them about what is your transition plan? What are your actual goals? Are you going into a field that's going to have a job, that's going to give you employment? And, and the, the biggest challenge we see with our families is for many of the students, many of the parents, they just can't see it. They, they literally, um, they cannot see themselves in a university, they can't see themselves in a college. So two, two and a half, or three years ago, we would have about 10 students going to do uh, college trips, and it was a really nice thing. One of our volunteers, former teacher, former counselor used to do it, they used to go to man. I, when I first learned about it, I was a little worried. I said, well, who's this gentleman who's taking these 10 students in a van going to visit colleges? Because you know, you know, we make sure this is it safe. Uh, wound up being a wonderful story that came out in the paper. We wound up expanding that initiative. And then last year, we sent 80 students going over to see universities all over the country. So we're at top performing juniors. This year, it's 250. And trust me, not all the students will go or leave the state or, or leave San Antonio. But what I love is they go to see Harvard, they go to see Middlebury, they go to see colleges all over the country. And then they come back and they realize, wow, I could attend a top university. So all of a sudden now, instead of thinking of San Antonio College, which nothing wrong with San Antonio College, now they're thinking of UT Austin. Now they're thinking uh, College Station. Now they're thinking Rice University. And so those are the conversations we're changing. On the other side, what we're also doing is making sure that both within our new schools and our existing schools that we're improving quality, that, that parents can really see whether it's an innovative dual language program, whether it's the type of environment that's in the classroom. We have an initiative where 
we're paying teachers uh, additional compensation if they have a strong track record, if uh, you know, if if they have you know, if they show the qualities of being a, a very strong, we call a master teacher, because our vision is to have master teachers across all of our schools, so that when families see uh, what we're doing there, they they want to be in that school because we know that neighborhoods housing. Um, frankly, you know, a lot of that is very correlated to our schools. Um, and then finally, is, as we're looking at our schools, making sure that we do have diverse schools. Because I will tell you, without additional resources, having schools that are 100%, you know, not just poverty, but in-depth poverty, where, um, you know, I have the majority of the children in public housing. I have the majority, you know, I have 2,000 children that are homeless. If we don't have diverse schools, with the funding levels that exist in the state, this, it is almost impossible to make significant gains. We're, we're working hard towards it, and we and trust me, uh, you know, we're working harder than ever, but that is just a batch without additional resources. So we are purposely now looking at our schools. We know who are, which children are there, what their demographics look like, and we're trying to create programs that frankly give these children a fighting chance. And so that's, you're gonna see that as a continuing thing for us as well. Excellent. So keep the mic. Uh, we're going to go one more back, and then we're going to do a few Q&A questions real quick. But my last question is, what can we do to help? How, how can we get involved in each of those areas? So the biggest thing for me that I will tell you, so first of all, know that we're going to own having quality education. That we're going to, you know, we are going to significantly, we are significantly, you know, going to push expectations. And, and you know, that's, it, it's not going to be, uh, we're in the beginning stages of our transformation. Um, again, you know, when I look at uh, Christine's presentation, it just reminds me that this didn't get created over the last few years. It was over 50 years. Uh, the West Side is a great example. It's my highest poverty area. But we're creating innovative school models. We're creating great options. You know, when I think about Brian, you know, what's, what's frustrating for me is the speed. Because I'm seeing these children, you know, I go to the graduations every year. So every time, you know, I'm seeing our numbers get better, but it's still not, I mean, you know, we went up to 54% of our children going to college. That's better than, than what it was three years ago, but it's not 100%. It's not even 80%, right? So for me, I was frustrated because I wanted those numbers to be higher. I love the fact that we have four students. It's a bit of a break. I got six of them in. Only four of them went. Now, the other two, one is a college station, one is at UT Austin. So I'm, I'm okay with that. But again, I want, I want those numbers to accelerate. I am convinced that the direction we're going is the right direction. It's not going to be always smooth. But the speed and how we get there is going to be dependent not only on our work, but what happens around us. So in other words, if we don't look at housing policy, if we don't look at policies around economic development, in other words, if you don't give my families a chance to better their situation by having a better paying job, by improving their housing conditions, those are always going to be challenges for us. And one real quick example, I have thousands of children that have learning disabilities just because they live in housing that has exposure to lead. I mean, thousands. I mean, like I, I talked to our staff in spe special needs, and they say, tell me why I have so many children with these learning disabilities. And they said a big factor for them is they live in this dilapidated housing where they're exposed to lead on a regular basis. I mean, those are the things that we're having to deal with. And so, as you can imagine, I mean, that's what I mean by we, we need your help to come together to solve some of these issues. We will own education. I can't own lead in the houses. Um, like to invite people both at the local, state, and federal level because at the federal level we are seeing, you know, uh, the current administration do a lot of the great work that was done under the Obama administration. So I think that's, you know, equally important to stay engaged uh, at that level. And then I would, you know, invite you all to uh, to be part of um, the Mayor's House of Policy um, uh, Task Force, specifically if you're interested in being.
districts are not keeping up with the times or we don't have you know mental housing available to help families like I think that's also another issue that we need to keep in mind is you know, kind of what Diego was saying is the right number matters but also um, what do we do after that what's the after effect or people being laid off <laughs> right um, and then also we don't we want to ensure that people have a place to go um, or have a job and we can't just change it overnight but I think that's really important Important as a millennial, obviously, I think um, understanding that you know, probably in the seventies you could work um, a minimum wage job and afford your education, and um, now that's not necessarily the case. You know, I was just going to mention something um, very quickly that when I was um, at the Housing Authority, the board. Um, adopted a living wage for um, all um, Saha employees. Um, and it was interesting because if you don't stop and think and look at your, as an employer, how you are contributing to this problem. Um, so it really requires, even that, you know, even the housing that we had, um, we had employees that were uh, earning maybe just above, you know, a minimum wage, which, you know, doing the math, you know, they're living under poverty and they're providing housing. And so I think it is important to have the conversation about wages. I think it is important to have a conversation about what is a living wage and, and then, you know, to understand sort of the pros and cons. And, um, but, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that home prices have increased almost 50% in the last five years and wages have increased only 15%. So there is, you know, when we talk about inequity, you have to address wages. All right, I'm gonna get these two and I got you last. Um, Thank you. So my question is, oh, sorry. My question is, to what degree is Steve as ULI involved in the mayor's housing Policy Task Force, and then also for the woman that's, that's uh, chairing that committee, what kind of timeline do you see for the task force? And the reason that I'm asking is because the density that you're talking about, Steve, I think from what I hear from, from people that I talk to is that people are supportive of density, they're, and they're supportive of the growth centers you know, versus sprawl. Um, but until there are those safeguards in place, to address the fears that people express regarding uh, gentrification or change of an undesired type. So not, not in my neighborhood, but good in my neighborhood, I think I've heard some people say. Gimby, yeah. And um, with respect to the comp plan, so there's trains on parallel tracks here, and with uh, I think one or two of the regional centers currently being planned, uh, with a few of the neighborhood uh, community plans currently going on. I've heard some kind of general, general national kind of generic things thrown out about uh, housing, which didn't really seem to get at what I understand to be the issue. So the question is, what relationship does the ultimate solution that the policy comes up with to what degree are those being related to the parallel process with the comprehensive plan, which is asking for people to buy into a future vision of change, but without those sureties, I'm not sure that buy-in is going to happen. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Do you have to do one that thing? Two, two, two to the three in the middle. But the two on the end are wonderful too. <laughs> The, the first question, uh, ULI, um, uh, a number of our members are kind of scattered throughout the committees, uh, Jim Bailey being uh, one of the main guys, uh, one of the great, great architect and a King William guy who's been kind of down here in it since he was born. Um, so then the, the second question about density, there, um, as you know, I'm a preservationist, um, so I've, I've been in King William, King William Association, and um, you know, I haven't seen a house yet that you can't bring back 
you know, we had a house in King Wayne that was just basically a burned structure, basically the exterior and some two by four walls, and it was brought back. It's a, it's a great house. It costs money, obviously, but um, but um, the projects that I've done so far, it's all been on industrial industrial sites, industrial dirt, or commercial dirt that's that has been um, has been abandoned, or the owners have. have you know, sold for a higher price and moved to the west side or, or whatever the case is. So um, San Antonio has plenty of those sites without getting into the neighborhood and demolishing housing, existing housing, um, you know, blocking up in the middle of the, of the neighborhood and, and, you know, putting up a 40 unit complex or like one person did from Boston, a, you know, kind of a four or five unit deal that dwarfs the rest of the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff is what gives density a bad name. Right. So we have plenty of land that's in the right locations to do the density that we need. Keep in mind though, when that happens, good things are gonna happen, restaurants are gonna come in, stores are gonna open up, your property values are gonna go up, and then we've got that tax problem again. So, you know, setting that aside, uh, I'm also one of the little subcommittees for VIA. And so we always talk about transportation, et cetera, and it's gonna become a much bigger deal as, you know, people may scoff at autonomous vehicles, but they're coming. Uh, and so what does that look like 10 years down the road? And what I've talked to, the, you know, the point I've made to VIA is that um, particularly in our economic environment, political environment, federal environment, um, money is going to get tougher and tougher. You can't look to the federal level to do anything for our, our you know, I don't think, for at least until things change. Um, for our housing issues, or local issues, transportation. Uh, and so what I've talked about is, and this is, goes back to that ULI deal, learn from what other people are doing and, and try and do something different or something better. Um, is that, you know, for all the talk about light rail in San Antonio, maybe you say, we can't, you know, we can't afford that, but let's do something that's better than that. And so the VIA plan for, they call it 2040, overlays with the new city comp plan, which is to have nodes of density in high employment locations. So you'd have nodes of density at the medical center. You'd have them at I-10 and 1604. You'd have them, you know, obviously downtown and UTSA and some other spots, west side or down uh, south side at Randolph and Kelly. Um, and if you can serve those transportation-wise with VIA and others in a, in a very tight way, and you've got plenty of land in those locations and plenty of land kind of scattered up and down our corridors to do the density, I think that's what you do, and you have to do it in a way and get the codes in place that uh, let people know that your neighborhood is protected, so it's not continuously a one-off fight uh, to preserve the neighborhood. Um, and, and that's what happens, and they'll wear you down. Uh, or they'll sneak it in the back door, and, and all of a sudden, density is, is evil. Um, well, it's not evil if it's done the right way and it's done in the right place. Just briefly, uh, on the question about the timeline, so the technical working groups uh, will meet uh, beginning this month through the end of May. Um, the groups are very diverse in terms of um, discipline, perspective. Um, we have you know, individuals that, that are experts maybe in housing or land use or financing. Um, and individuals that are, you know, community advocates that are, um, or, or that are working in education, health, transportation. The idea, again, being that we want to make sure that the conversations um, and really the policy recommendations are um, crafted with a diverse set of, you know, sort of perspectives, right? Um, these are complex issues, and as Maria Mediosaba um, reminds us all the time, she's one of the members of the Housing Task, um, Task Force. This is the first time that we have done this um, in, in this manner. This is um, really a public uh, policy making process, and we have tried our best to ensure that those of us that are on the task force, while we know some something about housing or something about how to get this done, we, we don't know everything and we don't proclaim to know everything. Um, and, and so, as she likes to say, this is historic. This is a historic moment. And, you know, I, I was reminded as I was thinking about preparing for today's session, and the reason I brought up the Housing Act of 1968 was because 
this is a year that we celebrate uh, 50 years of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. And shortly after he was um, assassinated, um, uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson um, adopted or um, signed the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And, you know, I think that it's really significant, right, that in 1968, um, we did away with discrimination based on, you know, race, color, religion, class, and then in subsequent years, um, discrimination against, you know, um, discrimination based on sex, familial status, and disability. Um, and here we are, you know, 2018, and we are still dealing with some of these issues. And so, I, I think it is, um, I think that you know this this is an important moment for us, and it is important to understand the historical sort of legacy of uh, disinvestment, um, segregation, the role that you know the private market and the federal government have had. But I think it's also important to recognize that we have the ability to, to change these things, and so yeah. Process of what is the coordination and the process of one example, I'm sure there are many others, uh, going back out. And how do you see that? Is there a relationship right now? Yeah, so there is, there is a relationship. And one of the things that the mayor asked the mayor's housing policy task force to do is to look at the alignment of, of policies out there. We know that there are multiple policies that have housing, including the comprehensive plan. Um, we know we have multiple boards and commissions related to housing. And so, how do all of those align? Um, and this goes back uh, to some of the work that they're doing, but specifically with regards to the comprehensive plan, um, our office works really um, well with the um, planning department. Um, and so we actually have an individual from the planning department that's working on the comprehensive plan come to every mayor's housing policy task force working meeting to make sure that what the task force is working on and saying is um, also in line with that plan, and it's not bringing that to our attention so that way we can say, okay, what direction are we going in? What did the comprehensive planning process um, out of all of that outreach and neighborhood engagement, um, what did they say? What did, you know, so that we're, we're trying to align it. We're trying to work cohesively with other departments. Um, I think part of your question uh, sheds light on one of the biggest issues we have is just an uncoordinated system. Um, multiple departments and policies and boards and commissions that are all trying to do the same thing. Um, and so one of the, this, that's one of the big goals of the task force itself <laughs> is to make sure that we're, we're working cohesively in order to bring um, the best policies. Can you answer the last part of that, which is um, the, the conference of Penn has very broad policies, so very general. Right. But right now there's, there's a couple of regional plans, there's Brooks, uh, Get all the other work that's going on. Right. Right now there's two community plans, and I think there's a downtown plan. Yeah. How those those are implementing these broad policies, and that's happening real time now with a very aggressive uh, timeline. How how is how the work? solutions that haven't yet been right. created? Because you guys started. Right. 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 So, right. I mean, how, how is that going to work? So some of it, you know, the the plans that you're talking about, which are Midtown, Downtown, UTSA, Westside, Brooks. Um, or land use plans, um, and of course that helps, that affects and informs our, our development eventually. Um, but your idea of the timing is a little different. Um, there are policies in place right now, for example, um, the seed chip policy, um, some, and also the, um, the city's policy for how they distribute unfunded grants um, that have to keep going um, in order to as we're, as we're going through this process. Um, so we're working together. Yes, there are five um, land use plans that are going on right now. They are related, um, but but that's specifically looking at land use itself. Yeah, I'll just close that and then move it on. Yeah. But my fear is that land use is not going to get support because of the policies that are in place today. That's my fear. Uh, Lourdes, did you want to respond real quick? Or? 
No. Okay. Um, Cynthia, did you have a question? Cynthia, did you have a question? Okay. I'm going to get this over here, and then we'll go ahead and close out. Um, hello, everyone, audience. My name is Clement Sullivan, and I'm re relocated from New York. And as I sit and listen to each and every one of you, all the issues discussed about San Antonio remind me of New York urban areas from 1984 to 2005. So you see, I'm going to disagree with you. Even though San Antonio is the seventh largest city and the fourth is an economic, it is a diamond in the rough. And I want you all to be aware of that, especially in Central Texas. The question I'm going to put forward to you is, what is the impact as new people relocate from big cities like myself is having on deep education? Because I'm seeing that it's going to change. It can be due to disaster, climate conditions, or too expensive to live in cities like New York, California, and stuff like that. And when they come, they come with skill, knowledge, academic education, and that would happen and see how wonderful that could impact. Thank you. Um, so, so you know, for us, what's, what's interesting is, um, so you know, you guys saw in Christine's presentation the different uh, boundaries that exist for every district. You know, we take it sort of a different attitude. We've said pretty much the entire city and the entire county is our boundaries. So we don't, so one of the things that's unique in Texas is that by law, um, I can accept children from anywhere. They can come from Houston. As long as they're from Texas, uh, they can come from Houston as long as they can get to my schools, and I don't have to get anybody's permission. And so because of that, when we set up our schools, and we now have 25, 26 plus district charters, they have open attendance boundaries. And what's interesting, what we're finding is that as families are either finding out about those options, some of them are brand new families coming into this, to the community, some of them are ones that are living out beyond 1604, they're actually willing to drive and come to our community. And what's interesting is that we're using that as a way for, for them to get exposure to certain neighborhoods. So for example, I have the, uh, my all boys school, Young Men Leadership Academy, in the east side, um, you know, one of the highest priorities of schools we have, and that school's attracting young men from, from all over the county, and I want them to see, like, look, I know you read in the newspaper that there's crime there and that there's all these challenges, but it's, it's a neighborhood, it's an up and coming neighborhood. Or at the Advanced Learning Academy, which is not too far from here, again, around that area, it's not that pretty, but it's an up and coming area, and families are driving from everywhere. So, so we're leveraging that, and so, so that's, that's part of our long term goal, is to really attract diverse families. I think for us, the biggest uh, caution that we have is that for some of our schools, they become very popular. And so, if we're not careful, we can, um, I, you know, we can exclude or not include, be inclusive enough of our neighborhood families. And so those are the things that we are thinking about a lot, but then one beyond that is how do we make sure our high poverty families don't get blocked out of that access as well, because many of my high poverty families are single parent households, they're working two jobs, and, and so I wanna make sure that they're aware of all the things that we're doing, and so we're actually starting to reserve slots for them to make sure that they're not isolated. But, but that's how we're seeing the impact. But we see the entire area as, our, as a potential, uh, as potentially our families can come to our district. Um, I would, as a, to talk about the benefits of that, because it is happening. And um, in, in some of those folks who are coming from out of state, and people talk about, well, they come to, you know, somebody comes from California, and they you know, move into to La Vaca, they move into Dignity Hill, and they you know, buy a property or what, what have you. Those were some of the first people who started to buy uh, in the urban neighborhoods because it's what they had seen before, they were comfortable with it, and they were, you know, uh, it's what they knew, and they weren't afraid of what was going on. The, the other thing I think that's been good is that San Antonio is, is uh, historically has been a very provincial city. Um, I always think that it still has kind of a colonial Spanish legacy. Um, and so getting that new blood in from out of town, so that San Antonio is kind of run by Alma Heights um, has been a big a big plus. Some of those people that have come in, uh, rack space has been, has been huge. Most of those people have a much more philanthropic uh, bent to them than our locals that we think of as you know, the people that support our institutions. Um, H-E-B, Red McCombs. We don't have a, a Red McCombs Business School in, at UTSA. It's at UT. We don't have a Zachary Engineering School at UTSA. It's a college station. 
Somebody told me the other day that the symphony, that the Houston Symphony gets more money from San Antonio than the San Antonio Symphony gets from San Antonio. People that live in San Antonio. And that's the, one of the mentalities that San Antonio has had for a long time. And those people that I think that have kind of, kind of run the city in that way for so long are becoming less and less and less of a factor. So the city and the way people think about social issues and how things work and how to bring things together is uh, much more worldly and sophisticated and altruistic now than I think it was 30 or 40 years ago. Um, because there's a lot of people in this town who don't look at, and not to pick on Alma Heights, but there's a lot of people that, that uh, view Alma Heights as their city, not San Antonio. You know, the only thing San Antonio is good for is to run down to the, the Gunner Hotel and have one of their events and you know, do Fiesta once a year, and that's it. So there's a lot of benefits to new blood coming into San Antonio, and it's, and it's um, that's what's going to help bring new industry to San Antonio, more businesses to San Antonio, because when they come and they have 100 jobs, they're not going to be filled by 100 Californians. There'll be 10 or 15 Californians, and the rest will be San Antonians. So you, you've got to have that. So uh, it goes back to that deal of, of uh, you know, being willing to embrace it and keep moving forward. Um, but solve, you know, that, uh, you know, solve the issues that, that make it a double-edged sword. And build more housing. And build more housing. <laughs> All right. Uh, did that feel like three hours? <laughs> it was three hours. It felt like three hours. Hey, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you to our panel members.